Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. International Rescue? Calling International Rescue. I can't talk any louder, so please listen carefully. What's it like down there? Oh, brains! You old son of a gun! Now keep tuned in, I I'll give you the full rundown. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, 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 sure. I, 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 get, I get you. I see. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. You'd think they'd have the uh -huh. decency to advise me of their plans. I see. What's the matter? Okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I, I and Kurt the gir girders out there. That poor yeah. chap's towing into his watch again. I ought to do it. Yeah. Say, I, uh, I, I think. I don't suppose... Uh, be more manageable that I don't suppose he, he might have escaped from somewhere, huh? Hmm? On the 4th of November, 1965, Hiram K. Hackenbacker, also known as Brains, made the world's first video conference call from a consumer device. True story. About the same time, we used to work in offices such as these, large open plan spaces with rows and rows of desks trying to cram as many people in as they possibly can. Obviously, today's environment is very different. We have breakout spaces, focus rooms, collaboration spaces, and my favorite, flexible rooms. So not only are we trying to cater for various tasks in the workplace, we're also trying to cater for multiple generations. From Generation Z, who want bean bags, milk crates, and ping pong tables, right through to the older generation, who have an expectation that they'll have their own office space. We're also working longer hours. And as a result, we're trying to create spaces to have fun and de-stress. And some organizations are, are offering free food uh, as a result to try and keep their employees engaged and keep them in, in the workplace. It has become our second home. As you can see here in this example, this is actually the OVG um, office here in Amsterdam in the Edge Building. Lots of soft furnishings to try and make it feel a lot more homely rather than your typical office cold space. We're also encouraged to bring pets to work. So when we talk about the workplace, we like to refer to it as a three-legged stool, where we have one, the people or the culture, two, the environment, so the spaces, and three, the technology. And just like a three-legged stool, we all three need to work equally together and support each other with technology being the, the enabler. Obviously, physical works, workspaces are changing, and it's critical for enterprises to adapt and adopt technology that will fuel employee engagement and improve culture. As millennials begin to dominate the workforce, it's vital for technology to draw users in with a friendly and familiar experience. A prime example of that is Skype for Business. Okay, we've all used Skype for many years. Why do you think Skype was able to generate so much market share in such a short period of time? Because it was familiar. We've all used it, we all know about it. So what's happened is consumer, consumerization has blurred the lines. What do I mean by that? Companies such as Amazon, Apple, Logitech, Google, 
are all making inroads into our commercial environment that we all work in. It's not uncommon to see an Apple TV device sitting behind a display in, in every meeting space that we come across. It provides native connectivity, and it's also used for digital signage in some organisations. Logitech is another good example. Back in the 80s, they started off making mice. They then moved on to keyboards and joysticks. What's interesting is in the last five years, Logitech has seen a 630% growth in their share price. Do you think that's because they're making more keyboards than mice? No, the PC sales, global PC sales have declined 30% in the same period of time. They've diversified. They've realised that they can use their market share, their brand, to get into the commercial environment. So let me ask you which one is better. Some would say the product on the right has maybe better picture quality, maybe it has better control, maybe it has better connectivity. Let's, let's ask someone who uh, knows a bit more, probably one of the smartest people that's going around. And I thought that was so brilliant. I said, oh, I am so smart. I am the smartest person. My uncle was a great professor at MIT for 40 years. Can you believe 40 years? I said, but I'm smarter than him. I'm smarter than anybody. Even our smartest leaders can't tell the difference between the two products. And it's not a case of which one is better. It's which one is more familiar. Typically, the end user has heard of Logitech. We live in a good enough world. I'll give you some examples of that. So here's an example of a consumer display, which is being used, obviously, in a commercial environment. I mean, this has been happening for years. This is nothing new. It's all around us. And I'm not saying it's the right thing, but it is there. And it's not necessarily that these devices are, are fit for purpose, but uh, you'll see wherever you go, just keep an eye out. But most of the time, we're, we're pretty much unaware. This is not a great example because the screen's not actually working. Um, but the thing is, it's. The decision maker at some point thought that it was fine to put these types of displays into the commercial environment, which would, I think we would all agree would be better served with a commercial panel. Another example, what's the world's most popular camera? Canon, Nikon, the iPhone. According to Flickr, in 2017, the iPhone had 54% of the market, over Canon 23%, as far as brands are concerned. As far as devices go, the smartphone had 50% of the market versus 33% for digital SLRs. We have so much power in our pockets, right here. Not only are we using these devices for social media, we're also using them for our calendars, our emails, obviously phone calls, photographs, room booking systems. I mean, the list goes on what we can use these devices for. Even when we travel, all those screens that were once in the back of the chairs of the seat in front when we're flying, they're all gone, instead replaced by these devices. And I know for myself, when I travel, I can actually be connected wherever I am in the world and still watch my favourite sporting events and TV shows on the pay TV subscription channels that I have. And if uh, this Ericsson report is anything to go by, smartphones in the next five years will almost double. They'll increase from 4.4 billion to 7.3 billion by 2023. So it's only a matter of time before these devices are actually used extensively in the corporate environment. What's interesting is that 
the technology has become that good that it's plateaued and all these manufacturers are finding increasingly difficult to actually innovate and produce new product. I mean, Apple just recently revised their forecast earnings um, down because they, they didn't, they're not selling as many devices as what they once thought. Really, I, I mean, I have the new, the new iPhone. Um, it's not that much different to the old one, okay? So it's difficult for these manufacturers to innovate. So who determines what's good enough? Is it the manufacturer? Maybe the contractor? <laughs> or what about the consultant? Any takers? The market, the consumer, the end user determines that it's good enough. The fact is, our standards and expectations are lower. And I'll give you an example of that. Hello everybody, I just got out of the bathroom, my hair's very, um, yeah, I'm just letting it air dry because I can actually let it air dry for once. Um, right, basically this is just a video to say I'm so sorry about the quality of um, my videos at the moment. Um, right now I'm filming on my husband's phone, um, but it's like nearly nine o'clock at night, um, so it's going to be very grainy. Um, my husband usually at work, so I can't usually use his phone. Um, and usually I'm only using my laptop because I kind of lost my Nikon in the Isle of Wight. So, um, yeah, it's a bit far to go to try and find it again. Um, but basically, I'm just really sorry about the quality. I am looking to get a camera, but I've got two girls, and of course, they will. I think we'll stop it there. I think we've all had enough. Now, I know what you're thinking. What the hell was that? What did we just watch? Well, I'm actually trying to make a point here, and we've all, we've all been there, we've all been searching for an answer. Maybe we've got a problem with our computer, and we're jumping online and trying to search for how to fix something. So, the reality of it is, is that if you can see it, and if you can hear it, and if you're getting the information that you required, then it's good enough. Okay, we don't need the best audio quality and the best video quality. Companies like LG and Samsung show a lot of innovation. And what's interesting is that they've almost become victims of their own success. They're making beautiful displays. I mean, it, Anyone who might have seen the recent uh, LG OLED roll-up display that was released at CES, it's an amazing product. And what we're faced with now, because these products have become so good, so beautiful looking, we're now getting our clients going, why can't I put them into my office space? Why can't I put them into the meeting space? And we're having these, as a consultant, we're having these conversations with the client, trying to explain to them why they should be using a commercial panel instead. <clears throat> Samsung released this, this document which explains the differences between consumer displays and, and commercial displays. And the first point's quite interesting where it says, chassis designed for more aesthetics. So I would have thought aesthetics was pretty important in the workplace as well. So I, I don't understand that point. The next point, they talk about brightness. Well, if it's bright enough for at home, it's probably bright enough for the office as well. Digital signage may be a different story. My favourite one is consumer TVs focus on HDMI connectors. Last time I checked, our industry uses HDMI connectors almost exclusively. And the last point, they talk about uh, consumer displays don't have RS-232 control. But what's happening is we're starting to see IP control being built into these devices. So a lot of those, a lot of those items there don't reign true anymore. And like I said, we have these conversations with our clients of, of uh, why they should use the commercial panel over a consumer panel. And the typical response we get, I can buy it at Tesco for a third of the price. I try and say, well, it doesn't have the same warranty and it's not made with the same parts and it doesn't have the same quality. 
and then we get, if it dies, I'll just buy another one. We need to start thinking like a customer. So what's driving this consumerization? We mentioned this one before, familiar, familiar brands, familiar technologies, familiar products. Convenience. Like I said before, we all have one of these in our pockets, our handbags, we carry it around wherever we go. We go to bed with it, we wake up with it in the morning. Accessibility, it doesn't matter where we are, we have that device. And we're always online. Another thing that's driving consumerization is standards. We're seeing a lot more products that are standards based in the industry. And with standards comes compatibility, and with, co with compatibility comes interoperability. These devices are simple and easy to use. And they're spending, a, they're, there's a lot of focus these days on that user experience. Uh, there was one of the previous panel members talking before, spoke about frictionless. Right? That's all part of that user experience. It's very important. And they're spending billions and billions of dollars on innovation, either internally or buying startups that can provide that vital IP that these companies require. But the fact is, we're actually also becoming far more educated. We've been using these technologies for many years. We're smarter, we're more savvy. Products are becoming more flexible. We're seeing a lot more wireless devices. It's easier to connect, easier to set up. And design, there's some of the most beautiful products coming out in the market, whether it's a product like the Nest thermostat or, or products from as I said before, LG, Sony, all these manufacturers are developing and producing beautiful looking products. But probably the biggest driver is, is cost effectiveness. The amount of technology that we can purchase, like the bang for buck that we get is incredible these days in the consumer world. I mean, being able to buy something like a Google Home, a smart speaker with a microphone built in for $50 is, is incredible. But with all this comes compromise. We're not necessarily going to get the best picture quality. We're not necessarily going to get the best sound. But with all these things combined and compromises are being made, we produce beautiful products that people want. So where to from here? We've all seen the Gartner technology hype cycle. I always find it interesting looking back at uh, previous years of this hype cycle and seeing what technologies have uh, come through, how accurate they were. So we're going to make our own hype cycle here. And we're going to talk about what I believe are going to be some influencing technologies in the not too distant future. I was recently at CES, Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and I sat through many conferences and, and listened to a lot of very uh, knowledgeable people in, in this area. Uh, this is one of the slides from the one of the presentations that I sat through. 83% of enterprise workloads in the cloud by 2020. Now, obviously, we're already seeing this happen, right? but 83%, that's a huge number. So we're seeing Office, Zero. There's a lot of pro uh, programs today that are sitting in the cloud. But the thing that I found most fascinating was 20.4 billion IoT devices by 2020. 20.4 billion. It's massive. And that's next year. So the Internet of Things, we keep hearing, talking about it. It's going to continue to grow. And I like this quote from the head of Qualcomm, uh, we spent the last 30 years connecting people and we'll spend the next 30 years connecting things. Which I think is very, very true. 5G is going to help with that connectivity. We're going to see a bigger jump from 4G to 5G than what we saw from 3G to 4G. It will enable a lot more technologies and a lot more services, a lot of real-time applications to come through. 
Once again, we're already seeing this, everything on the network. We'll be using, I mean, we're already using AV over IP predominantly. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uptake back home in Australia, but we're going to see a lot more of it. And as a result, we'll see a lot less middleware. So obviously, matrix switches are on the way out. But also, I think you'll find that transmitters and receivers will start to disappear. A lot of the panel manufacturers are already incorporating streaming technologies into their devices. So no need for a receiver. And it's only a matter of time before the, manuf the source manufacturers are incorporating that same technology into their devices. All right? So all that middleware will disappear. So the only survivors, I believe, in the next five, six, seven years are going to be microphone manufacturers, speaker manufacturers, display manufacturers. And with the displays, I think we're going to see a lot more prosumer displays coming through. The big three will flex their muscles and they'll start to come in and take over the traditional players in our industry. Control will be free. We're, once again, we're already seeing this. There are players out in the market. Control will be free in return for the data that they receive. And devices like this, Google's Home Hub, $200, get you a seven inch color touchscreen, built in microphone and speaker. The equivalent product in say, Crestron world, about a thousand bucks. It won't be long before you start seeing these devices pop up in every meeting space. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to be massive. Uh, Google have a product called Duplex. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'll play you a little video and uh, you'll get a bit of understanding of how powerful it really Let's is. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. It's just amazing where this technology is going to be able to have conversations, machines having conversations with real humans like that. I think it will be hard to tell the difference in the future when we're making a phone call and who's on the, actually on the other end. Is it a real person or is it a, a robot or a machine? But the biggest influence that I think we're going to see in the commercial environment is voice and digital assistance such as this. And whilst I was at CES, one of the presenters there came up with some uh, really interesting facts from a, a recent study that was done in December uh, 2018, where 21% of American households, 21% right, of Americans, I should say, uh, 18 plus, own a digital assistant or a smart speaker. And what's fascinating about that, that's a 78% increase from last year, the same time last year, 12 months, 78% increase. But what's even more interesting is that 73% 70, of the children in those households actually use this device or a device like that. These kids 
are the next generation of our workforce. There's going to be an expectation that these devices are in every meeting space. We'll control our environment via voice. Companies like Hisense are building in, or baking in uh, Google Home. So not only can you talk to your TV and control the TV, but you can control all the other connected devices. Now, connecting everything via voice is not always practical. Um, Amazon have run a few trials on, on various products, and uh, I'll show you the results in this video. Let's reheat pasta. Reheating pasta. It's cool, right? Yeah, I didn't know you guys put Alexa in a microwave. Yeah, we're putting her in a lot of stuff now. But trust me, there are a lot of fails. Like what? Like... Alexa, play my podcast. When you heard that, did that surprise you? Seems exciting. We need an Alexa dog collar for dogs. Ah, ordering dog food. Ah, ordering dog food. You can bark all you want, I'm not paying for any more dog food. Ah, ah, ordering gravy. Ah, ah, ordering sausages. Ah, hey, you better cancel that order. Let's have to a sucked. Let's have play music. Okay. And then there was the incident. Wait, that, that was you guys. I don't know, was it? <laughs> As you can see, it's not always practical. But the reality is there's nearly 60,000 Alexa skills with over 20,000 compatible devices. Now, sure, there's always going to be some limitations, um, maybe language, um, maybe also accents, for example. So it's not necessarily always going to work as expected. Alexa. Play Something's Cooking in My Kitchen on Spotify by Dana. I can't find Something's Cooking in My Kitchen by Dana on Spotify. It's no Dana. Alexa, play Something's Cooking in My Kitchen by Dana on my Spotify. I can't find Something's Cooking in My Kitchen by Dana on Spotify. It's no Fucking Donna! Fucking cow! Call oh, fucking Donna, Alexa! Fucking cow! Play! Um, Which device or contact do you want to call? For fuck's sake. Alexa! Stop okay. being a cow! Sorry, I'm not sure. You're fucking not sure? Alexa, I'm gonna be nice. Alexa! Please, please, something's cooking in my kitchen by Dana. I can't find something's cooking in my kitchen by Donna in your music library. Well, fucking look it up, you cow. Alexa, stop being an arse. Sorry, I don't know that. I don't want to hear a bloody well joke. I want her to play. I've been, I, that song popped in my head when I was cooking. I want to hear that bloody well song. I'm going to, I need it in an American accent. English or American? English. English. Oh, Christ. English. Alexa, play something's cooking in my kitchen. Boy, Dana. Here's a sample of something's cooking in the kitchen. Fuck okay. off! So we still have a little bit of way to go before we make it perfect. But I'd just like to wrap up now uh, with a quote from this guy here, 
I'm not too sure if anyone's familiar with this gentleman. Anyone that I'm connected with on LinkedIn, you might, he's actually in my profile picture and he's not my boyfriend. Um, but his name is Gary Vaynerchuk and he's an influencer, he's an entrepreneur and uh, he is very in touch with consumers. And he says, if you want to win, I highly recommend that you start training yourself to read the consumer. And I think it's some great advice that we should all take on board because at the end of the day, the consumer is the one that keeps us in a job. Thank you.